Welcome, my name is Lindsay Beebe. I'm an organizer here in Utah with the Sierra Club. And I'm really excited to, to have you all here today. Um, tonight we are here for Utah's Sustainable Communities in Action. And it is an official affiliate event with the Global Climate Action Summit, which is take, with, yeah, all right, yeah. <laughs> which, <laughs> um, which is taking place in San Francisco um, this week. Uh, and uh, we are really grateful to the presenters who are, are helping present this. Um, the Sierra Club is a presenter, um, the Utah Climate Action Network is a presenter, and um, KRCL, Listener Community Radio of Utah, so thank you for that. If you're not aware of the Utah Climate Action Network, this is just a little bit of uh, information here. Uh, we have um, a network of for-profit companies, non-profit companies working on climate here in Utah. And so if you can, these are all member organizations of, of the Utah Climate Action Network. Make sure if you see um, you know, your organization up there, or maybe not, um, it could be someday. So check it out. Some of the more, uh, um, some of the other network members here as well. So today's program, uh, we are going to start with a bit of information for you. Uh, we have a wonderful plant panel uh, that we are very lucky to have. So I'd, I'd like to thank our moderator and our panel for coming up here today. Um, we have Lara Jones from KRCL moderating. We have uh, Sarah Wright, the founder and um, executive director of Utah Clean Energy. John Cox is the vice president of government affairs for Rocky Mountain Power, likely your utility. We also have Tyler Polson. He's the sustainability program manager for the city of Salt Lake. And of course, here we have Piper Christian. If you haven't heard of her, you will. Um, she is currently a student at the U, but also a community organizer and one of the co-authors of Utah's first uh, climate resolution that passed last year, this past year. So a big thank you to all of them. Um, before we get to uh, a little bit of a presentation and then a panel discussion, when, and you'll have an opportunity to partake, and I hope you do, um, we are gonna hear a welcome message from the mayor of Salt Lake City, Jackie Biskupski, who is in San Francisco as we speak. And then we'll hear from the governor of uh, California, Jerry Brown, to give a little bit of context for the event that we're hosting this evening. So, uh, without further ado, a message from the Mayor of Salt Lake. Hello, and welcome to tonight's program showcasing Utah's sustainable communities in action. I wish I could be there with you, but I am currently attending the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco. Tonight's discussion is a local event, part of the Global Summit, and I am excited for you to hear about work happening in Salt Lake City and across the state. Tonight you will hear from representatives of organizations acting to help the United States meet its climate change obligations under the Paris Agreement. Achieving a sustainable future for our city and our planet will require action and leadership at every level of society. Whether it's high school students working with the state legislature, a public utility leading on renewable energy, or an entire community committing to reducing pollution and transforming how we power our homes, we all have a role to play. Tackling climate change requires an all-in approach if we hope to limit and ultimately reverse the challenges presented by climate disruption. I want to close by offering my personal thanks to the sustainability experts who helped create this event. Your passion and engagement are essential to ensuring a livable future for all. Thank you again for attending and enjoy the program.
And now we'll hear from Governor Jerry Brown to intro the uh, climate summit going on in San Francisco. I'm Governor Jerry Brown. Greetings from California. Look, it's up to you and it's up to me and tens of millions of other people to get it together, to roll back the forces of carbonization and join together to combat the existential threat of climate change. That's why we're having the Climate Action Summit in San Francisco, September 2018. Come join us. Entrepreneurs, singers, musicians, mathematicians, professors, students. We need people that represent the whole world because this is about the whole world and the people who live here. We have to do something and we can do it. That's why we want to join together in this Climate Action Summit in 2018 in San Francisco. Yes, I know President Trump is trying to get out of the Paris Agreement, but he doesn't speak for the rest of America. We in California and in states all across America believe it's time to act. It's time to join together. And that's why at this Climate Action Summit, we're going to get it done. So see you there. Thanks. I think Governor Jerry Brown took some speaking lessons from Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, we started a bit late, so for time's sake, I'm, I'm hopeful that they provided enough context here. Um, just a bit of background, we wanted to reiterate that this climate um, summit is uh, a planned, organized event to help us meet our Paris climate agreements. Uh, it is, you know, happening this week. It's bringing together literally thousands of people from across the country, and I really appreciate everyone here for taking part in that um, and and being a, a member of that number. Some of the uh, themes for the climate summit are up here on the screen behind me, but we are taking part, and we're going to be discussing specifically uh, energy commitments. Um, specifically, hearing from Salt Lake City and the commitments that they're making to reduce carbon emissions as a city. Um, we'll also hear from um, Rocky Mountain Power and how they are working in partnership to help make that a reality. Um, and we'll be hearing from Utah Clean Energy and Piper Christian about how um, activism and advocacy work in partnership to help make that happen. So that's a little bit about this evening's program. And without further ado, um, I'd like to invite our first speaker, uh, Sarah Wright, to come up. Um, she's going to provide a little bit of background about her organization, what they're working on. And um, we'll go down the line. You'll hear from each of our speakers. And then we'll have an opportunity for uh, some moderated Q&A. And then I hope that you'll um, raise your hand. I'll be walking around with some mics, and you'll be able to join in the conversation. So, Sarah, thank you. Well, it's, um, let me lower this a little bit. Great to see all of you here. Sometimes I feel like I'm speaking to the choir, but it's really nice that we're joining together. And I'm so grateful to the Sierra Club for hosting and Laura Jones from KRCL and the rest of our panelists and all of you to come together for this conversation. And um, so Utah Clean Energy, I founded the organization in 2001. My son was three at the time, and I knew that I needed to use my skill set to the best that I, my ability to address climate change. And we're kind of quiet. We work on policy and regulatory issues and some, um, some community issues, but we're really just trying to move the ball. And I'm proud of what we've accomplished, but we're not anywhere near where we need to be. And there are so many more groups working really hard on this now than there were in 2001. I think that we can get the momentum going. And, um, and there were many groups before 2001 working, but not really in Utah yet. So I want to leave you with just, if nothing else, a couple things. And you're here, you probably understand um, the first thing, and that's the bad thing and that it is, we are way past due the time that we need to make the urgent changes at the scale and scope that we need to leave a safe place for our children and grandchildren. We're overdue. 
And um, we're headed into a world that is nine degrees Fahrenheit on average warmer, 25 degrees Fahrenheit at the poles, and it is not a world that is consistent with an organized civilization. That's the bad news. The good news is, is that what we do makes a profound difference. That nine degrees warming, we are not locked into that. We reduce our emissions, we change the way we generate energy, there's other things to work on too, diet, agriculture, healthy landscapes. Utah Clean Energy focuses on the energy piece. But we're not locked into that, and what we do makes a difference. And um, I know that those statistics may sound scary, but a recent White House publication that was released last November in the Trump administration says exactly the same thing. Maybe not in as clear words, but in pretty clear words. So really all of us here, and to have the utility and the city working together and others on this issue, we can take it seriously and move that needle. And conversations like that, like this, are critical to that. So I'm going to take the liberty to um, read something. It's the, if you haven't read this report yet, the fourth national assessment released by the White House, November 2017, it has a 30 page, about 30 page executive summary that is highly readable and I recommend it. And then if you really wanna get wonky, it has links to deeper down into the report so you can read that. But here's what they say. The global atmospheric CO2 concentration has now passed 400 parts per million, a level that last occurred three million years ago, when both global average temperatures and sea level rise were significantly higher than they are today. And this is in the report from the White House. They go on to say that continued growth in CO2 emissions over this century and beyond will lead to atmospheric concentrations not experiences in tens to hundreds of millions of years ago. Think about when the dinosaurs lived. There is broad consensus, and here's another thing, that the further and faster we push our climate and more towards warming, the greater risk of unanticipated changes and impacts some of which are potentially large and irreversible. So we are pushing our climate system very quickly, if we can, uh, but it's not insurmountable to slow that down and mitigate some of the worst of the damage. So Utah Clean Energy, what do we do? We were some, one of the first groups to work on um, energy policy, advocate for renewables. Um, in a concentrated way in the state, we created most of the policies around allowing rooftop solar. Prices came down. Solar, you can see rooftop solar has taken off over the years. We're now in a case and working with many advocates and the industry now to try to find a solution where rooftop solar can continue to thrive because rooftop solar coupled with storage coupled with smart homes and being able to control your load is going to be a big part of the solution to have a flexible grid that can integrate lots of renewables. There's the utility side and the customer side, and we need both. Our Utah solar, our utility scale market has taken off. We have about 1,100 megawatts of solar in the ground, and you can thank President Carter. In 2013, Utah Clean Energy won a case on a law that was passed under the Carter administration in 1978 that gave fair evaluation for solar so that people, um, any um, company that wanted to develop solar, the utility had to buy it at um, the fair price that was equal to their avoided price. Now, um, the company, Rocky Mountain Power, is very interested in developing more solar. Um, things are really gonna move. Facebook is driving three to 600 megawatts of solar development in the state, but it's still not enough. That 1,100 megawatts coupled with the wind, coupled with some other things, we're still less than 15% renewables, so we have a long way to go. Um, the other thing that's the really good news is that the economics could not be better. Right now, when you look at this chart, the black dots are prices for how much we had to pay for renewable energy over the years. And you can see just in 2008, and you don't have to know exactly what these numbers mean, but we are paying, you know, 
$150 to $180 a megawatt hour for solar. Now, in 2018, we're paying $25 a megawatt hour for solar. That yellow bar is the price of uh, energy from a natural gas plant. So you can see that solar now is cheaper than natural gas. So we need to be building as much solar as fast as we can. Wind, Rocky Mountain Power is just doing 1,100 megawatts of wind in Wyoming. The economics, it's not about that it's too costly to make these changes. It's too costly not to make these changes. On the way here on Marketplace, they were talking about Florence, and I know all of our hearts go out to the people in the Carolinas and that part of the country, but on Marketplace, they're already estimating that these costs are gonna be $160 billion just from one storm. And last year, collectively, all of the um, events were um, in the United States were estimated to be $260 billion. These, these costs uh, dwarf the cost of changing our energy system. So the other thing that Utah Clean Energy does, our vision, you know, we have a mission and our vision, and our vision is healthy, thriving communities for all, empowered and sustained by clean energy, and while we've worked a lot on policy and programs and regulatory, we're just now working with communities that need to be served, that are underserved with energy efficiency programs. They pay a disproportionate amount of their um, income on energy costs. They're disproportionately hit by climate and air quality. So we've launched a tiny pilot um, and we'll be working more where we, Rocky Mountain Power actually donated the LEDs and we were able to swap out um, light bulbs and through that saved um, 80 tons of emission every single year and dollars on those people's bills. And then we have other community, cool community programs where we're working to offer discounts on EVs and e-bikes. And um, so anyway, I guess this, the first part is we need to move fast, we need to be bold, we need to act at a scope and scale that we haven't worked, but that we have all the tools that we need right now to address this problem, and they're economic. The prices for um, renewables couldn't be cheaper, and energy efficiency has always been the cheapest, cleanest resource available. So really, what's missing? What's missing is, part of it is the political and public will to understand this problem. It's really hard to wrap your, your head around the scale and scope of the change, and also the scale and scope of what will happen when we don't move. So Utah Clean Energy, we've, it's been so great to partner with Salt Lake City. They launched the Utah Climate Action Network. Now we help manage it. They brought us um, Path to Positive Utah. We have over 50 respected leaders in this state that acknowledge that climate change is human caused and we need to take action. There's a lot of other groups working on this that we are really thrilled to work with. I mean, I can't name them all, but many of you are here, so thank you. And um, the big thing is we just need to talk about it. We need to be, we need to understand that everyone doesn't understand the depth of the issue, and we need to be compassionate. And if, if someone's ambivalent, we need to help bring them along. Um, but we need to talk about it, and I truly believe that Utah can be the conservative state that flips this really partisan dialogue. And my time's up, and I thank you all for your attention. Uh, hello, uh, my name is John Cox uh, with Rocky Mountain Power. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, I guess I'll start my presentation by just uh, saying this, that, that I am part of the problem. Um, I, as a consumer, uh, am part of the problem. I think, uh, historically, uh, the power industry uh, has been part of this problem. Uh, and I would say that each one of us here today uh, has been part of this problem. Uh, and if we want to solve it, uh, each of us together needs to change. Uh, if you look at this particular chart, uh, you'll notice Carbon emissions by source, and you'll notice that historically, or at least over the last 20 to 30 years, uh, the electric industry, my industry, has been the leading source of carbon emissions. Um, and you'll see several others that, that are below that. Um, but I, I would also like to point out just one, one small thing, and that is uh, things have started to change. Uh, you'll notice that top yellow line, again me, I'm part of the problem, uh, has started to decrease. Um, and has started to decrease significantly to the point that in 2016, for the first time, 
we actually were overtaken by a different industry, the transportation industry. Um, you'll notice this is irrespective of elections. This is irrespective of uh, what party is in control of Congress. Uh, this is driven by the market. This is driven by you and me. And uh, Sarah, as she so eloquently put it, uh, this is driven by dollars and cents. Uh, wind power is increasingly uh, becoming a cost-effective solution. Solar power is increasingly becoming a cost-effective solution. And you're going to see that yellow line up top continue to drop. Uh, and it must drop uh, if we're going to solve this problem and, and solve it together. Uh, what are we doing here locally uh, at Rocky Mountain Power? So Rocky Mountain Power, we are a six-state uh, energy company. We have one point or approximately 1.9 million customers throughout the Intermountain West and the Pacific Northwest with our sister utility Pacific Power. Um, there throughout those states, we serve our customers uh, with a, a diverse set of resources, um, a set of resources that historically has been a carbon emitting set of resources. Uh, that's beginning to change. Uh, just recently, we announced a, a new project, uh, which took a lot of work to get approved through each of our six states. And thank you to Sarah and your team and many others for your support in that effort. Uh, but we were able to get a, a project approved, and now we're in the, the, the phase of the project of construction, uh, that'll cost us $3 billion, uh, billion with a B. That's approximately 10 times the, city bu uh, the budget of Salt Lake City, and we're investing that in wind energy, predominantly in the state of Wyoming, uh, but it will benefit our customers throughout our six states. Uh, to give you a feel for the percent of that that will go to Utah, it's uh, closer to, to 50%, just under 50%. Uh, of that energy will come to Utah customers. That's 1,150 megawatts of new wind. Uh, as a comparative uh, measure, that's approximately the equivalent amount of energy to power 400,000 uh, new homes uh, here in the Valley, a significant uh, amount of benefit for our customers. Uh, in addition to this, I'd, I'd point out uh, every two years we come out with a new IRP. It's our uh, integrated resource plan where we look out for 20 years and we say, what kind of energy demand will there be out there, and how are we going to meet that demand? I'm proud to say that in our last IRP, for the very first time, there is no additional thermal generation throughout that 20-year period. As coal units come offline, as other units come offline, we will replace that energy with increasingly renewable resources uh, like this wind project. What else are we doing at Rocky Mountain Power to help fix this problem? Uh, another thing we're very proud of is our initiative dealing with electric vehicles. Uh, a few years ago in the 2016 legislative session here in Utah, uh, we got approval uh, to spend $10 million uh, to expand out electric vehicle infrastructure throughout the state of Utah. I like this photo because I'm from rural Utah, and when I think of electric vehicles, I get a little nervous, or at least I used to get a little nervous, about being out uh, among many of the beauties in our state, but not being close to infrastructure and being worried about how could I charge my vehicle. Um, part of what we're trying to solve with this, this funding, again, $10 million uh, from, from here at Rocky Mountain Power, matched by a $4 million federal grant, which we received, will go uh, to build out that infrastructure. Uh, we just announced earlier this year that we fully electrified uh, I-15, which means you could drive from the, the Idaho border on the north to the Arizona border on the south and not have to worry about range anxiety. But there will be charging stations, uh, thanks to, to our efforts uh, together with our partner Maverick, uh, that you could charge your vehicle. And we're expanding that uh, to go to I-80, to I-70, uh, as well into our neighboring states. Again, we serve customers in Wyoming and Idaho. The plan is to have uh, electric vehicle infrastructure in place so that you could drive from Yellowstone National Park uh, to Disneyland. If you went to Disneyland, I don't really like Disneyland, but you know, uh, Yosemite National Park would be a, a better example. And, uh, and, and not have to worry about that range anxiety. In addition to that, uh, we're doing a significant amount of effort with workplace charging. Um, while this is nice uh, and, and it's important as people make that decision to buy a vehicle, what we found is that most people actually charge their vehicle not at, at these different gas stations that, that have these chargers now across uh, our interstates, but rather at their place of work. And so we've uh, and continue to offer incentives uh, for employers throughout the valley who would like to have charging infrastructure there for their employees. It makes for a, a great workplace incentive. Um, I'll maybe skip over this, but again, 1,500 miles of, of DC uh, fast chargers. We've got level two chargers, again, in, at workplaces. Uh, we're trying to do this uh, throughout our service territory, but also connecting to, to other neighboring states that have similar uh, objectives. 
We have uh, partnerships with Uber and Lyft to encourage uh, electric vehicle adoption by those uh, ride hailing services. We've worked in conjunction with Park City on their electric bus system. We're working with UTA to do the same as they expand their system. Uh, just a tremendous amount of, of potential there. Uh, this chart I like because it's uh, data that I didn't provide. Uh, we're talking about sort of assumptions looking into the future and it's always kind of a dangerous place to be. Uh, in this case, uh, if you look at assumptions of what electric vehicles will be like, uh, it's kind of all over the map. Uh, so I tried to choose uh, a, a group here that I thought would err on the side of conservatism. Uh, this particular group is OPEC. They have every incentive in the world to not want to see uh, electric vehicles take off, and yet look at how they changed their forecast from the year 2015 to the year 2016. Uh, a dramatic amount of increase in electric vehicles. Uh, we would love to see the same here in the state of Utah. We know part of our air quality problem, uh, nearly 50% of that problem is caused by tailpipe emissions. We'd like to solve that problem. Uh, and again, as we increasingly green the grid, uh, that electricity would be provided by renewable resources. Uh, last two things I'll, I'll say and I'll, I'll wrap it up. Uh, Sarah briefly mentioned our partnership with Facebook. This is not an insignificant amount of, of electricity. Uh, as we look at uh, Facebook's uh, recent announcement for building solar farms in Utah, they announced 337 megawatts of new solar build out in Utah in addition uh, to what they're building for their data center uh, there in Eagle Mountain. That's a significant amount of economic development from rural Utah. Again, I mentioned I'm, I'm from rural Utah. Those folks are struggling. And uh, this is a tremendous opportunity for them while also providing clean energy for growing tech businesses here in the state. Uh, and then finally, uh, our subscriber solar program, thanks to, to partners like Salt Lake City who are early adopters of this, we're able to provide solar energy to folks like you and me uh, who perhaps can't afford uh, rooftop panels on the roof or perhaps are in a renting situation where they couldn't put it on there. Uh, this provides a great opportunity for them to participate in it. Uh, it's so su successful it actually is sold out quite quickly. We're on a waiting list right now uh, and looking to uh, expand that, that program significantly. There's a lot of other things that we're doing, but I'll say this. Uh, there's a lot more we need to be doing. Uh, I started by saying we are part of the problem. I absolutely stand by that. I will also say that we want to be part of the solution. Uh, one of the last things, and I'll, I'll leave it to Tyler to talk about this, that we're incredibly excited about is a partnership with Salt Lake City, with Park City, and many other uh, forward-thinking municipalities throughout this state that would like to grow green. And uh, as the utility provider here in the state of Utah, we would like to provide that to you. So thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Okay, you're halfway through the, the PowerPoints. Piper, do you have PowerPoint slides as well? She does, okay, here we go. So, um, Tyler Polson, I'm fortunate enough to work on energy and climate change issues for the city of Salt Lake City, and I'm, I'm just gonna jump right in. And so, in addition to temperatures in Salt Lake City heating up, um, so is concern about climate change here locally. This data comes from a national organization that Sarah had mentioned, Eco America. They do polling on climate and clean energy attitudes across the US. And they've selected four markets for more in-depth polling them, one of them being Salt Lake City. And so they've done three consecutive years of polls on climate attitudes for the Salt Lake City media market, by the way. This isn't Salt Lake City proper. The media market includes territory even outside of Salt Lake County. But what they found is that roughly seven out of 10 people in the media market are concerned about climate change. And that concern has been rising in recent years. In addition to that, and interestingly, 89% of respondents said that they believe there is a moral obligation to deal with climate change. And so what do we need to do? You've, you've heard a little bit about this. Um, in the words of Bill Gates a couple years ago, we need, we need an energy miracle. Um, we need to accelerate the adoption of carbon-free technologies at, at probably an unnaturally high rate. And so in the article, Gates had talked at a national level about, about two things that were just a prerequisite to starting along that pathway. One, more R&D investment from the federal government. And then two, probably more essential than that, a price on carbon emissions, a carbon tax. Kind of the push and the pull um, to moving the market 
more rapidly towards the clean energy solutions we need. And so why do we need a miracle or, or a transformation? Uh, this graphic was built using publicly available data where we looked at electricity use, natural gas use, on-road transportation fuels um, across Utah and averaged those out. And this represents the average daily natural resource uses for a, a Utah household. Um, 17 pounds of coal, a little over 200 cubic feet of natural gas, so if you think about a cubic foot being roughly the size of, of a beach ball, and three, three gallons of gasoline. So um, we're not unique in this regard nationally in terms of, of how carbon or resource intensive we are. Um, we certainly have benefited to a very, very large degree from burning all of these fuels, um, but it also kind of sets us up where we, we truly do need uh, a transformation to, to solve this. Personally, and, and you've heard a little bit about this as well, one of the reasons I am hopeful is, is solar power and, and where those trends have been going. Um, just to talk for a moment about the, the solar panel itself. Um, you're, you're all generally familiar with it. They're roughly six feet tall, three feet wide, weigh about 40 pounds. Um, if you were to install one of those panels, a 300 watt solar panel in Salt Lake City, over its 25-year warrantied life, it would generate the equivalent power of burning 10,000 pounds of coal. Um, it's amazing, an incredible powerhouse. And, and that statistic, that reality, is in large part why the economics of renewables make such great sense. Um, I looked it up today, a 300-watt solar panel is now $200. Sure, you have to pay install costs and everything like that, but the equipment itself is extraordinarily cheap, um, the cheapest among, among energy over its life cycle. Um, so what have we been working on? Uh, Salt Lake City has been concerned about climate change for a long time, for mayors going back really 20 years. Um, but I would say that 2016 marked a major inflection point in terms of the scale of our commitment and the reality um, that, that we could achieve these goals. So in 2016, Mayor Biskupski and the City Council signed a joint resolution committing to net 100% renewable electricity by 2032, so less than 15 years from now, and also an 80% reduction in carbon emissions. But very critically, later that year, um, Salt Lake City also formalized a partnership with Rocky Mountain Power. And so you see pictured here Mayor Biskupski at the podium. Right behind her in the red jacket is Rocky Mountain Power CEO Cindy Crane. And so the city and the utility have agreed in concept to begin working on the pathway to getting our community, um, along with Park City, along with Summit County, uh, Moab's interested as well, um, net 100% renewable power over the next 15 years. And I'll just quickly define what I mean by that. So what I don't mean is that 15 years from now, every electron flowing to, to buildings within Salt Lake City households and businesses will be from renewable energy. Um, the reality of it is these resources are going to be constructed within, they're going to be new resources, but within Pacific Corps' six-state portfolio, um, balanced against those resources um, so that we do so most efficiently and, frankly, quickly, so that on a net year-to-year -year basis, enough new clean power is flowing to the grid generally um, to power our communities. And so to learn a little bit more, there is a joint implementation plan that was published last year, and it's updated every spring, available on slcgreen.com. Uh, the plan covers not just renewables, but some of the other great things John talked about, specifically in the way of electric vehicles um, and some of our partnership on energy efficiency and grid work. And I should say very critically, one reason why this partnership and why 100% renewable electricity is so important to solving climate change is when you look at the energy-related greenhouse gas footprint of Salt Lake City, um, over 50% of that is associated with electricity generation. And then another 17 to 20% is from on-road transportation. And so to the extent we can power our grid with renewable energy and then also repower how we get around with electric vehicles that are powered by renewable energy, uh, we can reduce emissions greatly, 70% plus, and do so in a few decades and start to make the progress that's needed. For a more, more holistic look on what we're working on, the Climate Positive Plan is published on our website as well. Waste and recycling, transportation, um, food, all of these things are covered within that plan. So I just wanted to close with a little bit of, of broader national level 
context. Uh, Mayor Biskupski co-chairs an initiative spearheaded by Sierra Club at the national level. It's called Mayors for 100% Clean Energy. And when she made the commitment in 2016, she was the 16th mayor in the US to make, to make that type of a commitment. Fast forward two years, there's now over 200 mayors in the US who have signed on to this, this initiative across political lines, Republicans, Democrats, independents, um, all of the above. And so things are really starting to move and they're starting to move um, from more of a grassroots local level taking the lead. In addition, over 400 mayors in the US um, in response to the indication that you know, we may withdraw from the Paris Agreement um, have committed under a program called Climate Mayors to attempt to achieve those goals on a local level. Um, so who here has, has read the Paris Agreement? Has anybody read it? I read it. So I, I, I've read it and um, it's surprisingly short. It's 25 pages long. That's it, cover to cover, 25 pages. And the reason it's so short is um, its brevity allowed every country in the world to sign on and agree to these terms. But essentially, all it's saying is we wanna limit warming to well below two degrees C. Or in other words, we wanna limit um, unmanageable disruption to our economic systems, our social systems, kind of the joint future that we all hold. And so it's a pretty, pretty agreeable um, aim that, that, that we're all working towards. Um, locally in, in Salt Lake City, you know, Utah's warming according to NOAA data, data at twice the global average in recent decades. And you can go on their website and download data sets on a city by city level. I did this for Salt Lake City. This is the annual average temperature. And you can see, starting in the 1950s, um, fast forward through last year, things are definitely trending, trending upward here. Um, the other thing that I did was map not just average temperature in the decade, but the single warmest year in any given decade. Um, what are the extremes starting to look like? And you start to see this, this literally jump, jump off the chart here. Not just once, but in fact four times since 2010 did we exceed um, kind of what is within our, what we know in our lifetimes living here, what my parents know growing up here in Salt Lake City. So we're starting to, to see those results um, very, very early on actually into where, to where the climate may be headed if we don't act. Um, for comparison's sake, the, the purple dot or the purple star here I added, that's Albuquerque in the 1970s and 80s, the average annual temperature. So we're 500 degrees southeast or 500 miles southeast, right, from a climate perspective of, of where we were, you know, um, now, where, where Albuquerque was in the 70s and 80s. But Albuquerque is similarly warm, so that's not where they are today. So my time's up, and I just wanted to close with, with an haiku. Um, a, an oceanographer involved in a lot of the, the global climate reports created a series of 19 haikus to synthesize and just simply convey um, what the science is telling us. And I, I think to a large degree, how you take this message matters, um, despair, now and 10 years from now and 20 years from now is, is not all that helpful, but um, th this really is an opportunity, an opportunity to shape the, the future. So thank you. Thank you so much for the privilege of getting to speak at this event. Um, I was extremely excited to get to come and present for the Global Climate Action Summit because I think it is a demonstration that us as citizens can take matters into our own hands and even when we see federal inaction, we really can make a difference in our communities. So I will confess that I lack the statistics that my fellow panelists were able to offer, but I will do my best to compensate that in some storytelling about my experience as a high school student and how we've been able to work to push climate policy within the state of Utah. So I am Piper Christian, and I am formerly the president of the Logan Environmental Action Force, known as LEAF Club. Um, we were a small club that was started um, back in the 1990s by Jack Green, who's present today. Um, and I had the privilege to get involved with this club as a sophomore in high school. So the Logan Environmental Action Force promotes environmental stewardship through political engagement, 
educational initiatives and recycling and anti-idling projects within our high school. Um, and I want to start kind of by giving some background because I feel that it's relevant particularly to the Global Climate Action Summit. I became passionate about being in this environmental club because in 2015 I had the opportunity to go to Paris during the Paris Climate Accords and witness some of the events going on within the city at that time. Um, and I was completely taken aback by the opportunity of actors from all over the world to come together in collaboration to find solutions to limit our global warming. Um, and so with that enthusiasm, that is what I brought back to the Environmental Club, and we really got it started and did everything we could to get involved within our high school. So unfortunately though, as we saw during the 2016 election, um, it was very evident that with Trump as president, the Paris Climate Accord uh, was in jeopardy and that we were not going to have as great as involvement as I had hoped. And I remember feeling incredibly discouraged and really afraid for the future. And I think the primary feeling that I felt was a sense of powerlessness, that there was so much going on at the federal level that was out of my control and what could I do to get involved. Um, so I came to my peers and we talked about how we could better engage within the state of Utah and influence politics in our own way. So what we found through the help of Jack Green was a resolution that was introduced in 2010 that encouraged the EPA to cease its CO2 reduction policies until carbon dioxide research had been, or, and climate data had been substantiated. So in essence, this resolution introduced in 2010 chalked climate change up to be little more than a conspiracy. And we believed that this kind of mentality within our state was no longer reflective of existing climate science and also put our generation's future in jeopardy. So with that in mind, we decided to introduce the concurrent resolution on environmental and economic stewardship. So in essence, we approached our state legislature as students and we drafted a climate change resolution that we presented to them. And we were fortunate to have it sponsored by Senator Jim DeBacchus. Um, now this was back in 2017, I believe, when we first introduced it. And we had plenty of critics when we did this. Um, many believed that with a state that consists of an 83% Republican legislature and gets approximately 90% of its energy from fossil fuels, that it was not possible to have such a resolution, have any success. But we persisted, and um, unfortunately, at the end of that legislative session, we barely scraped by with a five to five vote in the House Economic and Workforce Services Committee committee. So it was discouraging initially that we were not able to get the progress that we had hoped. But fortunately, we were able to come back in the next legislative session and reintroduce our legislation under the sponsorship of Representative Becky Edwards, a Republican from North Salt Lake. And when we did this, we came into it with a brand new approach. We wanted it to take the opportunity to engage more actors throughout Utah and make this an effort to promote collaboration throughout our state. Um, so we were able to engage countless environmental organizations as well as businesses. And what exactly does our resolution talk about? It recognizes the impacts of a changing climate on Utah citizens and encourages the reduction of emissions. Particularly, it identifies that we need to aid rural communities in a just transition away from fossil fuels, and we need to use our history of environmental stewardship as well as economic accountability to accomplish such things. So what was the impact of our resolution? Well, after reintroducing our resolution during the next legislative session, we passed it through our state legislature and successfully got it signed by Governor Herbert. We, thank you. And as I mentioned, in order to accomplish this, we had to gain the support of both businesses and environmental organizations. We were able to get approximately 15 environmental organizations and 16 businesses to sign on, on in support of our resolution. And additionally, what was critical was engaging students in the political process. This is what we truly believe was the, the, the critical element to our resolution's success. So every time there was a hearing for our climate resolution, we had 
countless students come to the state capitol and write personal testimonies about why climate change is an important issue for today's kids. And I think that that really brought the, the emotional element to why this is an important issue for us today. And as a result of our efforts, we gained national attention. We were featured in, um, by CNN as well as the um, Yale Climate Communications, and our story has been broadcasted on over 370 different radio stations around the country. And I think the primary success of it was that it laid the groundwork for future legislation. We acknowledge that the resolution is only a starting point, and we believe that what it did was create a, a atmosphere within the state legislature where we don't have to see climate change as a partisan issue. And here are some photos from our success celebrating our resolution and the students who testified. So I wanted to look just beyond simply our climate resolution and talk about some of the other efforts that our environmental club has worked on. I think that it's really critical that we engage young people in environmental initiatives, as I've mentioned. I think right now, a lot of young people feel particularly powerless and giving them the opportunity to feel that they can make a difference in their community is critical. So in order to do this, um, as a junior and as a senior in high school, we organized the Utah Youth Environmental Summit. And what this was, was an opportunity to give students the grassroots skills and environmental leadership in order to lead efforts within their community to improve the environment. We held workshops, guest speaker presentations, and outdoor excursions. And we had over 15 schools participate in our event. Um, it was really incredible because we were able to draw from schools from every corner of the state of Utah, and some of the testimonies that we heard from students were really incredible. Particularly, we had students from Rose Park talking about how they wanted to clean up the Jordan River, and other students talking about air quality initiatives in Ogden and other corners of the state. And what was clear is that we have a generation that is not only very passionate about this issue, but well equipped with um, you know, ingenuity and creativity in order to take on the issues that we are currently facing. And finally, I think we often lose sight, we get so overwhelmed by the scope of the problem that we forget how important it is to take personal action within your community. And so I wanted to touch upon briefly some of the efforts that we made simply within our high school and community. First, we installed new bike racks in our high school. We hosted environmental education tables at farmers markets and festivals. We recycled over 2,000 pounds of cardboard during school construction. And we promoted a countywide clean air poster contest. These were ways that we engaged actively with our community, and it was especially fun talking to young children and being able to hear their input on how we can make the world a better place. As you can see, some of them are working on some brilliant art projects. So, in closing, I just want to say, when I initially saw Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord, I was, like many of us, feeling incredibly discouraged. But I think particularly here, I look around the room and I see people like Jack Green, members of Student Organization for Society and Natural Resources, and so many of my own heroes within the state of Utah who have really inspired me to take action. So I think when you feel discouraged, look to people like this who are in this room today and look to them for inspiration. I think in the state of Utah, we really can lead the way in environmental efforts. So thank you so much. Thank you, Piper. And to the rest of our presenters, thank you very much. It is time now to hear from you. First, though, I do want to uh, throw it over to our, our wonderful moderator, Laura Jones. She'll kick things off. And then if you do have a question, um, we'll, we'll turn it over to you. And we'll have two mics on either side of the aisles here. So just raise your hand. We'll get a mic to you. And please feel free to join the conversation. We really hope you do. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. So, and please wait for the microphone because this is being recorded for Channel 17, Salt Lake City's community cable uh, channel, and we also are going to be broadcasted on KRCL. So, I, one of my first questions for, for the panel does relate to the Trump administration, and I'm kind of curious your thoughts with uh, the backing, the threat to back out of the Paris Agreement and other 
uh, statements and potential policies. I was talking with Sarah in particular about this. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Because it feels like it's motivated people within their own communities. Sarah. Well, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't go so far to say it's a good thing, but I would go so far to say as we have partners and leaders in the state coming to us now that wouldn't before, because I think they thought that the feds were gonna take care of it, and now they understand that we need to act, and so that gives me some hope, but there are a lot, there's a lot of bad rollbacks happening. <laughs> I don't want to sugarcoat it. Okay. Anyone else on the panel want to address that? John? I would just say, uh, I, I mentioned our WIND project. Uh, we, we announced that the day after uh, President Trump announced uh, the, the rollbacks on, on the Clean Power Plan, I believe it was. And, and we got a, a lot of kind of confused looks of, you know, what, what, what are you doing? You know? And uh, the, the fact of the matter is, today, uh, what's a bigger driver for us are not so much the push factors of, of federal mandates or other mandates, uh, but rather pull factors of our customers' demands uh, and as well decreasing price. Um, whether or not you change some of these federal regulations, um, you can't change the, you can't repeal the law of supply and demand. And uh, we are seeing that change dramatically. Well, and John, I wanted to ask you a question about that with Rocky Mountain Power. What is the why of doing it uh, as a regulated monopoly? How reactive are you when you get these news stories about customers upset about you know the solar and the arrangements for that? Uh, I want to know about the why within the business model uh, for being sustainable. Yeah, it's it's one of our six core principles is environmental stewardship. Um, I would say though that some of our other core principles, one is uh, customer service. So as a customer is demanding something, uh, that that impacts it. Another one of our, our core uh, business principles is financial strength. So when we talk about, uh, for example, the, the $3 billion wind project, we looked at every possibility out there. We looked at uh, you know, new solar, new wind, new, new anything. And the nice thing about the, the wind project is it came in at the lowest cost. Um, I think historically what we've seen, and, and Sarah, in your presentation, you, you sort of alluded to this, we saw this price differential that, that made it so you had to choose one or the other. You know, choose the environment or choose uh, affordable power. That's uh, a paradigm of the past, or it's, it's quickly changing. And uh, in our case, the most affordable kind of power uh, or new electric generation was, was renewable power. All right, do we have some questions out there in the audience yet? Uh, Lindsay, let's, where are the microphones? All right, here, sir. So, um, I just, my question is for John. I appreciate your message tonight. And um, in the spirit of thinking big and thinking bold, what do you think it would take to retire Pacific Core's coal fleet by 2030? Yeah, so we have, uh, and I appreciate the question, we have, uh, again, six states that participate in each of our generation assets. Um, so whether it's thermal generation, whether it's solar, whether it's wind or, or whatever else, uh, we do have a, a state, the state of Oregon, that uh, their legislature said, we wanna be off coal by 2029. And we said, we'd love to work with you. And uh, ultimately supported that bill's effort. Uh, because the state of Oregon said we're willing to, to essentially expedite the depreciation to pay for their fair share of that and, and not leave our other customers or other states on the hook. So any state that's willing to do that, we will gladly support that effort. I will say um, our, our other states are a little bit different. Um, I, I think Washington and California are very similar. Uh, I was just in Wyoming earlier this week. Um, they, they, they feel a little bit differently. So uh, that same year, uh, I, I actually uh, uh, was helping out during our legislative session in Wyoming, and there was an effort to, to do essentially the opposite of a renewable portfolio standard. So a renewable portfolio standard says you have to have X percent of your generation coming from, from renewable sources. Uh, this particular legislator and eight co-sponsors uh, said, no, 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 we want essentially like a coal portfolio standard. They said 95% of our, our electricity has to come from coal and 100% by you know, 2019. Uh, we, we were able to defeat the measure. Others disagreed with that assertion. Um, I, I will say I think what's driving a lot of that though isn't so much the attachment to, to the research, uh, resource, so much it is uh, the, the economies of these small communities. I mentioned I'm from rural Utah. I have friends who work in a coal mine. And uh, as we transition to wind power, as we transition to solar power, there's not an equivalent number of jobs. We've got to do something as a company, as a state, to help those rural communities make that transition. Uh, all right, next question up there. 
on the left. Hi, John. Thank you. My name is David. I had a quick question for you, please, about storage, overnight storage, and how do you see storage beginning to play into the resource portfolio and resource planning? Yeah, so energy storage, I think, is the most exciting part of energy right now. Um, and, and it takes a lot of different forms. Um, we've seen the price point come down, not to the place where it's, it's necessarily cost effective in all instances, but it's, it's starting to change. Um, I will say we, we've done a little bit with, with hydro storage as well. Um, I think there's some opportunities there. Um, you do need to be concerned though on the environmental impacts of hydro storage. What will that have impacts downstream? Uh, but, but I do think you're going to see that dramatically change. Again, I, I mentioned our 20-year sort of forward-looking uh, integrated resource plan. Um, right now, the price point isn't quite there for storage. I would not be surprised to see in the very near future that change. Um, and once that changes, that's, that's a completely different uh, ball game as far as base load generation is concerned. All right, question over here. Uh, thanks, excellent presentations. Um, you know, I, I loved what, Sarah, what you said, just casting vision at the end of your talk about uh, perhaps Utah being the red state that flips this partisan issue around. Um, it's great to hear what, uh, what the city of Salt Lake is doing and what the NGO community and some of the private sector is doing here, but I, I'm concerned about our state's leadership. And uh, quite honestly, our, some of our state's leadership have, have left Utah with some black marks with very aggressive environmental decisions. And uh, to my knowledge, um, we also approved nearly $2 million in the last budget to sue California over its cap and trade program, which is one of the pillars of Jerry Brown's climate legacy, and one of the things I think we're all celebrating here. So I'm curious about the status of that possible lawsuit and what might be done to uh, prevent that kind of a blemish uh, from happening again on our state for anyone who'd like to tackle Anybody that. Anybody want to tackle it, Sarah, John? I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert lawmaker. in this by any means. Um, I, I, I've not heard of any efforts uh, moving that forward. I do know money was appropriated for it. Um, full disclosure, we as a company didn't, didn't support that effort. Uh, we trade energy every day back and forth with California. And in fact, you know, we, we still have some, some coal plants uh, active in our system. Uh, but the way that we operate those coal plants are very, very different today than they were even four or five years ago. And it's because of California solar. There's so much, and, and, and a lot of Utah solar too, but there's so much new solar generation out there that essentially what we'll do is we'll ramp down our coal units during the middle of the day while, those, uh, while that solar energy is out there. And uh, unfortunately, we have to ramp them up at about 5 p.m. as solar comes off. Um, but, but it's in our best interest as a company, it's in your best interest as a customer to take on that low cost renewable energy. If we don't, where else is it going to go? I mean, ultimately, for thermal generation, you have to pay for gas, you have to pay for coal. For solar, once it's built, that's free energy, uh, and we need to take advantage of that. Sarah, any thoughts? I haven't followed that case, okay. so I don't know. <laughs> but it's yeah, uh, I have a question with regards to uh, putting renewable energy on our rural lands and uh, you know, I, I, I grew up in a rural Kansas, and now when I drive across Kansas at night, it looks like there's a red blinking snake for about 40, 50 miles, and um, it might be fine to put solar panels in, in rural BLM, BLM land, but we're still not really solving the problem, which is, it sounds like if, if we were to build 4, 400,000 new homes that were mandated by legislature to be built zero negative, we're decreasing the demand and we're also creating it so that we're not having to build more on the future. So, and, and then uh, I also think that maybe we, instead of having large power lines from rural communities to our urban centers, we use our urban centers like industrial corridors to build our, our, our solar, put our solar farms on, or maybe like the, the 900 West uh, uh, large transmission line. There's huge acres of land where panels could go. We don't need to really go out and destroy rural Utah or Wyoming and then have 20, 30 percent transmission loss on, on. So I think it's time for us to, like, like she was saying, work with our legislatures and maybe mandate zero emission homes being built across the West and, and in the nation. So we're, we're, we're grabbing it right by, by the, 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 the use, you know, and then build the homes that are also power efficient. So. Well, I'll speak to that a little bit. I agree completely that 
the cheapest, cleanest energy is the energy we don't use, and that we have the technologies to build those homes right now. And we have builders like Garbet that's even building production homes that are net zero ready. Um, regarding the renewable energy development, I think it's yes to all. I wish that we could meet all of our energy demands just within our urban cores, but um, the energy density that we need is just not there. You need to cite them carefully. There are BLM efforts that people like the Wilderness Society and others are looking to make sure that those places are cited, um, that the solar is cited as best as possible. And then I don't like those red lights either, but if we find a better solution in 20 years, we can take them down. We can't take the carbon out of the atmosphere. And also those ranchers and landowners are making a big profit and keeping their farms alive through uh, lease payments. Tyler, uh, can you expand on that in Salt Lake City? I was looking at your new dashboard that, uh, I don't know if it came out this week, but I got the press release, and you can see the, the age of the housing stock. So we're talking about new construction, but the majority of the housing stock right now exists, and my house dates back to 1903. And so, Retrofitting those houses is expensive, and folks that are struggling just to make minimum wage aren't going to be able to affect change in their own houses or apartments. Yeah, so I, I mean, you're right that in terms of the timeline horizon for our goal now through 2040, that most of the emissions, most of the energy use is in existing, existing infrastructure. And, and to Sarah's point, when you look at how, how communities in Utah and U.S. or across the world address climate change, there's kind of three main pillars to doing that. Um, one is the transition to 100% renewable electricity. Um, two is electrifying transportation and then a lot of other end uses. But then three, critically, is to reduce energy waste through efficiency and conservation and to a large degree in existing properties. Um, in terms of the economics of those decisions, over their life cycles, they almost always pay off. Um, efficiency does pay. Uh, there is kind of that upfront hurdle that can be a, a burden and even a, a real sizable burden for households. One thing Salt Lake City is doing in the very immediate term is our city council has funded a $200,000 residential efficiency program where we're going to start working at a neighborhood scale, engaging households. Um, and encouraging all of those cost-effective measures from light bulbs to um, cold water wash to replacing your furnace filters, all the things that make sense financially and reduce emissions, um, starting at that scale and hopefully growing that program if it proves successful. Okay, questions? I have a question. Um, <clears throat> there seems to be a growing tendency among cities in Utah to make roof, residential rooftop solar less attractive by increasing the cost uh, of, of consumers or of people who uh, purchase rooftop solar through establishing uh, increasing uh, base rate fees, they call it. I have a good friend that lives in St. George and I think he says it would cost him like $50 a month uh, if he went solar. Uh, so what can Rocky Mountain Power do to help uh, 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 power companies and cities uh, incentivize uh, residential rooftop solar instead of making it uh, more expensive for them? Yeah, great question. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to wear the black hat here today on this one. Uh, so, so you mentioned specifically uh, municipalities and you mentioned St. George City. So uh, St. George City and, and many other, uh, or at least some other municipalities in the state do have their own power system. And so each of those may have different solar rules. They're not our customers, I can't speak to them. I can speak to, to our customers, including here in Salt Lake City. Um, we, we have uh, suggested and, and pushed for changes to our current net metering statute. And uh, we've gotten some changes on that uh, as that moves forward. Um, our concern and our complaint, and feel free to disagree with me, uh, is that uh, essentially by us giving a full retail credit uh, for your solar, um, that's not the true cost of that energy. So essentially, I take that, that kilowatt hour that you're providing uh, the middle of the day when, when you're producing more than you're using on your home, and I've got to use that immediately somewhere else in my system. So we take that electricity on one of our power lines, and uh, we send it off to another customer. 
um, that costs money. So if I'm, I'm taking that and I'm paying you full retail and then I take it somewhere else in my system, move it around and sell it to someone else, um, that's, that's losing money. I can buy... Are we, are we saving well, you money too by producing uh, clean, safe, uh, renewable energy uh, and w that yeah. we, we use the grid less because we are producing that energy on our rooftops. We are cutting the demand for yeah. new power uh, and so we are reducing, um, or, or, or we're, we're sort of serving in part as your uh, pollution reduction uh, uh, effort because we are producing clean, safe, renewable power. Correct. Wouldn't it make sense to compensate us for that in some special way, or at least not charge us extra for using the grid. So, and again, I, I, I don't expect to convert people to the cause here today, but uh, I will say yes to everything that you just said, except for our peak when we need that electricity the most is not when you're sending it back to us. If you could do what the previous person suggested, which is battery storage, and you could move that from the middle of the day uh, just a few hours later to 4, 5, 6 p.m., that's when I have my peak, that's when I have to ramp up my cloning it, that's when energy is most expensive. If we could change the paradigm just a little bit there, that would be very helpful. What I was going to say, and it, just let me conclude with this and then you can disagree with me again. Uh, I can buy solar on the mar uh, open market for about a third of the cost of what the state of Utah has required me to pay you on your house. Why should I have to pay three times as much for your solar when I could pay significantly less for because solar from a solar Because that's the moral farm? thing to do. It's solar versus solar. It's, it's, you want to encourage people to produce clean, safe, renewable power, right? Yeah. Let's do it. So, Sarah, I'm curious about what you talked about with President Carter and the fair price. Does this play into this conversation? That's a different, that has okay. to do with utility scale, mm -hmm. and that was to allow, because Rocky Mountain Power and others, they're regulated monopolies, um, it was hard for different renewable developments, developers to gain access to the market. So President Carter passed there, they passed a bill to allow mm -hmm. that, but that was for utility scale. Seems like the incentives uh, worked almost too well and created a, a choke point. There, was back, there were backlogs, and then the cutoff date for getting in under the old net metering rules, John. And uh, so now you need the technology to ca catch up and get you the battery storage to even this out, perhaps. Yeah, and, and I will say, uh, you know, as we think about like a new paradigm with electricity, the way that we charge electricity today is based on your total usage for a month. Uh, it would be helpful to get to a place where we're charging you consistent with what the market charges. If we could align price incentives uh, to a point where you're encouraged to, to adopt that battery storage, um, or you're encouraged to build that solar and to sell it to us when we need it the most, um, now all of a sudden I don't need all of that other generation. I can ramp that down or in some cases close it. Um, I think there's a way to align incentives on this um, ultimately, you know, I don't know that we're, we're quite there, uh, but I do think we are making progress. And one other point, too, on this um, issue of it's the moral choice. Uh, somebody's got to pay for it one way or the other. So if in making this moral choice you give a greater credit to these residential uh, generators, someone else pays for that loss then, right? It all comes out in the math. Yeah, and, and historically, we, we haven't had many rooftop solar customers, and we have a lot of customers, so you know our other customers can pay a little bit. Um, I, I think you, uh, Laura, pointed out this very astutely, and that is this has turned out to be very, very successful. We have a lot of people uh, who, who have solar panels on their house, and I would point out, historically, it's been more affluent neighborhoods. That's not the case anymore. Um, my office is out on the west side of Salt Lake City. I see a lot of solar panels over there. And uh, so it's uh, part of this is market driven. Prices have decreased across the board, uh, but yet those incentive structures have remained in place and you're starting to see those change a little bit. And uh, ultimately, I think we've got to get to a place where, where folks can continue to participate. All right, let's go to the microphone here. Oh, there you go. Got it going. Uh, two quick questions, if that's okay. One to John, I'm not putting you on the spot, and then Tyler. So. On this frame of uh, storage, I don't know if this is in your realm. What about the, you showed a graph of the vehicles. So what about 
uh, using vehicles as our uh, grid storage. And, and yeah. then... Yeah, and I, I think there's tremendous opportunity for that. So I, I mentioned uh, the marketplace in which we buy and, and sell power, the energy imbalance market. Uh, if there was ways at larger scales through battery technology, whether it's your vehicle or something else in your home, to, to participate in that, uh, that could drive tremendous value to our customers. And, and ultimately, our, our belief as a company is if you're the customer that's providing that benefit, you should get that money back. So right now, for example, if you have an, uh, an electric vehicle in the state of Utah, we have a, a, a special tariff program for you. You don't have to participate in it, but if you do, and you use energy at periods of time when it's in low demand, you, you get that benefit. And uh, I, th I think the same would certainly hold true. We'd like it to hold true for battery storage. For grid stabilization. Yeah. And then the other question, Tyler, real quick, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but so to the 100 by 2032, how are we doing on new development? Are we keeping, are we staying up to pace? Are there earlier, I worry about all these 20 year off goals if there's not earlier set points to our goals to be met. Right, and then right. are we keeping up with new development at this point? That's my main question. The intent is absolutely to keep up with new development. Where it stands now um, for the energy wonks in the room, the Salt Lake City community consumes around 3.3 billion kilowatt hours of electricity a year. It's been roughly that number for the last decade or so. But the intent is um, first and foremost to get state level legislation passed and then to get these renewable um, these community renewable offers created that over time match demand and and to the extent there's there's more development or more electrification hopefully of transportation that grows electric load um, within city limits we we meet that with with new renewables in the future as well so com completely the intent right down here I have a question uh, mostly aimed at Piper I look around the room and I see a lot of uh, older generation, uh, myself included, many people here are a bit older than you. This might not be the most exciting thing for the younger generation to engage in. I also look at the name Utah Sustainable Communities in Action and we're hearing mostly about solar and energy, but when I hear the word sustainable community, I think about our day-to-day -day life, how we honor our resources, how we create a culture where um, it's, not just, it's not just throw away, throw away this, you know, disregard um, our planet and, and the way we do things. Do you have any advice for us in, from your own perspective and from the work you've done, how do we engage the youth to make this exciting and fun and engaging and really change the culture to, to, meet, to meet the needs of the future? Oh, Piper, that's yours. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think uh, what, what I, when I think in response to that, the main thing that has impacted my actions was when I was in Paris, I had the opportunity to speak with some youth activists from Bali and Peru and other parts of the world and hear about the projects that they did within their community. And then coming back to Utah, I was able to work with kids from Utah State University. And so what I saw was that it's essential that we empower young people to become leaders in, this, in, in environmental initiatives and then give them the opportunity to go inspire other kids. I think what's really critical is that we see that other young people are capable of doing this and therefore we can too. So um, I think that's really important is empowering youth leadership and then giving them the opportunity in platforms like this where they can encourage young people to get involved. And, and also I think, you know, for many kids it's daunting because this is, there's, you know, so much data and so much research behind climate change that some of us don't feel like we have a point of entry. We see how important it is, but we don't know where to begin. And so I think creating opportunities like what we did in the state legislature where young kids can give their own testimony about why this is important, um, those are really critical, giving them a platform to speak and share. I hope that properly answers. Talk about your peer group just a little bit more versus perhaps the establishment, the grown-ups <laughs> that are in charge. Do you feel that your peer group, it's a little more baked into your DNA to um, not get caught up in the, bio, in the partisanship or the debate about climate change and science? You, it seems like you guys have moved beyond that. Yeah, I, I would agree that I, I can see that among my generation, um, this is becoming less of a Republican or Democratic issue. 
And I think that was really evident in the state legislature. Um, when, we, when we were bringing a group of kids to testify, I really thought, oh, it's going to be maybe a, the cherry-picked like, liberal kids in my high school will come to attend. And I, I walked outside and I stepped on the school bus and it was completely packed. We had an entire school bus of students from our high school. And I looked around and saw kids from every different political spectrum, every ethnicity, you know, every, every religious body. And I saw that this is not something that needs to be partisan. And what I think was so amazing about having young people in the state legislature is we brought that spirit into the Capitol and we showed we had, you know, we had a Muslim student talk about her faith and how that relates to climate change, and an LDS student talk about her faith tradition. And I think, you know, bringing that kind of spirit that, um, that clearly our generation is on board with and, and kind of opening that up to the folks in the state capitol and organizations around Utah and show this clearly does not have to be um, a, a red or blue issue. Excellent. We have time for one last question. Alan, I saw you up there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm involved in the solar industry, and the bad news that hasn't been talked about tonight is a plummet in the solar industry. Uh, Rocky Mountain Power is 61% coal <laughs> and has no plans over the next 20 years to purchase its own solar. They want to allow other investors, utility scale, to buy it and build it, and then you'll pur purchase the power. What we're saying is we need more distributed energy, uh, across the board, we want to open the floodgates. Uh, the issue is not discussed also as the legislature in Utah. Many of the things that all the experts want don't get passed, even though two-thirds of a majority of people want clean air, they want clean power. So Rocky Mountain Power, you really have to, instead of being the turtle in the room, 61% uh, coal, one of the dirtiest power companies in the country. That's the fact, and we're just asking you to speed up the transition everybody agrees on. Instead of being a roadblock, the example of this compromise for the solar industry, we have no evidence it was good. All you did was, the day after Trump was elected, Rocky Mountain Power started the net metering ballot. The day after. That's what happened. And because you knew you could threaten worse consequences, you could get a committee behind a closed door and say, this is as best as we could get. And it was great, except the solar industry is plummeting. And Electric Car Day is Saturday. Electric, uh, drive electric day. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate the softball in conclusion. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I would point out the, 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 the agreements uh, changing our net metering uh, statute. Uh, was was an agreement not just with Rocky Mountain Power and, and policymakers, it was an agreement with the solar industry. Uh, we had Hill Utah, we had Utah Clean Energy, uh, we did have uh, the solar industry uh, here in the state of Utah as well. Uh, I, I will say there's other impacts uh, or other contributing causes. Certainly there's uh, tariffs right now uh, from the Trump administration on solar panels themselves. That certainly plays a role. Um, one thing I worked really, really hard on Sure. Well, and, and the big boys, which we don't own them, but uh, that is, uh, you know, 10 times the amount of rooftop solar is, is from these big solar farms. We historically have not built those because we don't receive the 30% tax credit that a traditional solar developer can receive. Um, I, my team and I, we worked really, really hard this last legislative session. We had support from, from folks here on this stage. Uh, to change that so that we could also receive that tax credit. We would love to build solar. Uh, we've been at a com uh, competitive disadvantage. We'd like to change that. Uh, with that change in state law, we believe, believe we'll, be, uh, we'll be able to do so. Uh, last point, you said in our 20-year plan we said no solar. That's not cor uh, correct. We do have not just the new wind, but also new solar as well. All right, we're going to wrap up here. And Piper Christian, where can people find LEAF or Utah Youth Environmental Solutions online? Um, I, we have an Instagram and Facebook page, so you can follow uh, at lhs.leaf if you want updates from that. Um, and then the, Utah, the second annual Utah Youth Environmental Summit will be held October 19th to 21st at Brighton Ski Resort. So if you have children or students who are interested in getting involved, please contact me after. Tyler Paulson, what's the website you'd like yeah, we to recommend for what you're involved in? Our website is slcgreen.com, and I would close with a little 
commentary of support for, for John here um, <laughs> and his company, Rocky Mountain Power. You know, what, what we are attempting to do um, is, is not just unique, it's, it's the first of its kind in the country, is my knowledge, um, for an investor-owned utility and one of their partner communities as a whole to commit to 100% renewable electricity at the CEO and mayor level. I don't think that's ever happened before. Um, and similarly, the legislation that Rocky Mountain Power is genuinely partnering with us to move forward in the very immediate term um, would be the first of its kind and, and very meaningful, transforming the energy system in terms of what, what's powering um, Salt Lake City and the participating communities. So I, I would just say kind of in spite of some of the, the commentary and, and, and dialogue um, that, that we're appreciative of, of where we're headed and the kind of commitments that are in place. And hopefully we, we're successful. I mean, you really, really, really should be rooting for this to work. Um. Excellent. John, where can people find information about all the projects you've been talking about, the EV, the electrified I-15 and I-80? And yeah, uh, Rocky, Mount, uh, Rocky Mountain Power .net is our website, but uh, specifically on the EV front, liveelectric.org. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find out about uh, incentives and other programs there for EVs. And Sarah, Utah Clean Energy. UtahCleanEnergy.org is our website. And I also want to give a pitch for Climate Week, which is October 1st through 4th, there, or 7th maybe. There are events across the state. And um, you can find about that on um, the Utah Climate Action Network. And again, I want to remind folks, the 7th Annual Utah Drive Electric Week kickoff party and rally. <laughs> is coming up this weekend. Also, September 18th, 9 to 5, here at the Library Net Zero Energy Summit. Thank you all uh, for coming. Thank you to our panelists for braving this intense topic and giving, giving a conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I'd also like to thank our moderator, Laura Jones, for joining us tonight. And I would, I would love to give a big round of applause to Stan Holmes. You may not have seen him, but he helped pull this together and created the event for everybody. Thank you, Stan. And we heard about Utah Climate Week. It's October 1 through 7. It's a full week. <laughs> and uh, there's also a, a Citizens Climate Lobby Regional Conference on September 28th. Looks like information can be found online, perhaps on Facebook. So check those things out. Uh, and if you need to get involved, if you're inspired at all today and you don't know where to start, uh, we're here to help, so visit us out at the table, um, the Sierra Club, and many of our partner organizations are happy to help you engage in productive conversation, and we really appreciate you taking the time to do that tonight, and, and thank you again to everyone who participated. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you.